So we do have we do have quorum. Uh, we are missing one director, Johnny Hughes, and all other directors are accounted for. Um, I mentioned before some of you joined that Josh is unable to join us today due to a family uh, medical situation. Um, we have a, a really short agenda today, I think. Um, I got uh, I got approval by nobody complaining for the October minutes and they are published and the November meeting did not happen. Um, so all of our minutes are are currently up to date and published on both the uh, the Git repo and the blog. Um, the second item on the agenda is just again just informational uh, because we're not ready to take action on this yet. Um, we have received I forget the exact numbers. I think we've received eleven nominations. We had two decline and two never responded. And so that gives us a total of seven active nominations and all of those people have accepted and sent in some variety of, um, of uh, nomination statement. Um, I hope that all of the board of directors has seen and read those statements. Um, I, I have to admit that I was, I naively thought that we would have a, a tiny slate and it would be an obvious decision, but I was really pleased with our nominations. I think we have some really high quality nominations on there. So I do encourage you to um, not make your decision before you've actually read all of the nomination statements. Yeah, and on that function, it's always a sign of a good, healthy community when somebody nominates someone else. And since we had some nominees decline, they clearly didn't self nominate. So that's uh, a sign of like our community cares about our community. I was also interested that a couple of the nominees are coming in via SIG involvement and not um, core involvement. So that was that was kind of encouraging too to me that those communities want to have a greater voice in governance. All right, the first agenda item that requires discussion is a proposal for an extras repo on CS9. And uh, Brian is here. Um, I, I think you communicated well on the list, but if there's if there's more discussion to be had, or if you want to give us an overview, that would be great. Uh, yeah, so I can um, maybe give like the the thirty second pitch or something. Um, so in uh, in in previous iterations, in most of the the CentOS Linux releases and in CentOS Stream eight, uh, Sig leaders uh, go through this process where they uh, build their CentOS release packages, and then they have to ask for uh, those packages to be included in the extras repo uh, in, in order for them to uh, those to be able to, to be installed on user systems and things like that. What I'd like to do with this proposal is to uh, basically take uh, some of the, the extra red tape out of that process and have them just tag for release directly for those CentOS release packages. So uh, what I'm proposing here is that <clears throat> We set up a sort of SIG-like structure for that repository. Each SIG chair would be an ex officio member and added to that group and, able, and would be able to tag those packages for release uh, just directly whenever they're ready. Um, so uh, I just wanted to bring that up is that's what, uh, unless there are uh, other discussion items or the, uh, you know, the board members think differently, uh, we're gonna go ahead and proceed with that. I think the one, follow-up item that may be interesting to some folks is um, what do we do about third-party repositories like Apple or uh, other things like that? So I think we can come up with a, uh, with a policy if someone is interested in, in sort of drafting that together, uh, or that could stay with the board here. But uh, I, I think my intention is to go ahead and, and get this uh, group created in the account system, get the tags created and do uh, the repository for CentOS Stream 9. And then it's likely that this will get uh, that same sort of um, pattern will get applied to CentOS Stream 8 at some point. So um, first of all, do any, any directors have any objection to moving forward with that repository or should we tweak the proposal in any way? 
So I love the sound of it. I'd love to see it documented. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's a very good point. I think the uh, the one thing that's going to be most important is documenting the third party repository criteria um, because that's been a, a, a thing that's <laughs> that we've worked on for a long time, and it's it, it's definitely something that needs to be documented. So, how do you re resolve conflicts? Uh, what sort of conflicts do you? Expect if, if one sick created by package that's already is already available in in Eper or in another sick namespace, or are they supposed to be able to roll back? Uh, so uh, just to be clear, this is just for release packages. Yeah. So the the extras repository is not going to contain actual content in CentOS Stream Nine. Uh, anything that uh, any sort of real content would need to go in its own SIG style repo. This is just a, a home for those release packages so that okay, sorry. users can install, uh, they, can, they can do uh, DNF install, CentOS release uh, uh, storage and get the storage SIG repos, for example. Okay. Yeah, I would second what Pat said. It would be useful to have this documented, both from a, how this works and from a, if you're a SIG, how do you make use of this? Uh, but the proposal itself seems fine by me. I have a, a question from a governance perspective. Um, SIGs report quarterly. Would, would it be meaningful to have this SIG report in any way? Um, and if so, who would be, who would be responsible for that? I mean, it seems like a meta sig, and I'm not sure what what reports it would do, but you know, just to put that out there. Would this fall under the infra sig? Maybe would it make sense? We we could put this under the infra sig. Um, that is a, a possibility. I love that idea because then it's got clear ownership and mapping. And uh, to be clear, I plan on shepherding this for a, a while. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to serve as a point of contact for the, the work that happens under this. But for the most part, it's uh, uh, the idea is to turn SIG chairs a little bit loose for releasing their own content into, um, uh, into extras here. Do we have any further discussion here? Uh, so Bex put in the chat that it would be nice to report on how many packages are being updated or maintained um, for the release packages. I think that's that's probably a good data point. Um, I think the I, I, what I would expect though is that a lot of times the the SIGs would uh, end up you know putting a release file in here or a release package in here and then just you know not updating it because those repo definitions don't need a whole lot of maintenance once they're spun up but uh, but yeah that's a good uh, uh, a good thing at least to pay attention to yeah I think one thing that may be useful to expand on what Max mentioned maybe encouraging SIGs if there's changes are notable notable updates of their packages to put that out in their reports, that could be valuable. Um, I don't know if you have a way to generate our automated stats from CDS or whatever, that could also be another option if you want to be able to show these 20 more packages are available in this CD report or whatever. Yeah, to me that, um, that sort of information is very useful, especially coming out of the individual SIG reports themselves. And maybe we can provide some uh, some extra facilities for SIG chairs to help generate their own information as, as part of that. Um, yeah, I think that I think that would be useful. Like, I think yeah, if there's a low barrier of effort for getting the data, I think people would be more encouraged to make use of it. Uh, 
Uh, turn to your comment about conflicts. Have we ever done anything about conflicts? Like my understanding is that six have more or less been independent always. So there's never been an expectation that there wouldn't be conflicts between SIG repos unless there's a previous agreement between them. Am I missing something here? I don't think so. I hope. That matches my expectation. Yeah, like I think in general, it would be nice, if, especially to avoid conflicts with Appel, given that everybody uses Appel. Like that is something that, for example, in hyperscale we pay attention to. But I think it'd probably be difficult to say that all of the SIGs need to avoid conflict between each other because the combinatorial metrics you need to test against is pretty huge. Yeah, I think even in the early days, the uh, storage SIG had conflicts between, I want to say it was RCU that was needed for Ceph and Gluster. So I, I don't think it's a huge issue. And we, we, we never had the uh, Apple as an external repo huh, as well. Uh, every package was rebuilt in CBS. We, we never supported Apple, just as a reminder. That's true. That's just a fairly recent thing, the ability to build against Apple stuff in CBS. If we're concerned about um, about conf uh, uh, you know some sort of conflicts between the release packages or the the, the repo files themselves, uh, this could also serve as a touch point if we um, it, you know if we want uh, SIG leaders to provide some sort of heads up before they release something. This could be one of the the avenues that we have them uh, sort of notify the community and the rest of the. Uh, the consumers that they plan to conflict with another release file. Yeah, having it as non-blocking guidance is probably fine. Don't conflict with Apple, don't conflict with base. You can supersede versions if you need to, blah, 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 the usual stuff. And maybe just a note that we can remove a release package if uh, it's not maintained somewhere. Uh, just as a, as your ways, it's always good to have that written somewhere. So I guess so I guess there's an action to actually write this up. Yeah, Brian, if you could uh, have something for that, it probably wouldn't be much more complicated than just basically taking the dump we've got in the notes and making it slightly prettier. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. Uh, I would, so I, I am happy to do that. I'm also happy to, um, you know, basically convert uh, all of the feedback that you you just gave, plus, uh, you know, some of the policy level documentation that we need. Uh, I'm, I'm planning on converting that into a section in, in the SIG guide itself so that it's available for folks where they expect it. Um, but I would like to go ahead and get the, you know, the whole structure created if, uh, if everyone's okay with uh, with continuing on that right now uh, and not necessarily blocking on, on some of those items. I'd, we'll get it done, uh, but I think we need to, um, we need to get moving on. We, we've got some SIGs that are asking to already release content. And I think it's, uh, it'd be good for us to get that structure set up. Yeah, it seems uh, reasonable I don't, to do this in parallel. Yeah, yeah. I don't object as long as you one. promise the documentation is coming. All right, I will get started on all of those things. All right, thank you, Brian. Do we have any more discussion on this topic? All right. Um, the next item is issue 67. Um, and this is regarding well, I think that there's several interrelated issues. This is regarding secure boot and SIGs and signing. Um, there's ticket number 67, but this may be broader than that. Uh, can someone, 
give us an overview of, of uh, what, what the topic was here. I can summarize this, I think. Thank um, you. So the short version is that a number of six would like the ability to build and ship content that needs to be signed so that it can be used with secure boot enabled. Specifically, iSquareScale needs this for the kernel because we want to ship our own kernel. KMODSIG was interested in doing this for KMODS. Um, in both of these cases, unless the content is signed with a key that is trusted by Shim, the content cannot be used. Um, because if you sign it with a private key, the user ends up having to manually enroll keys, which is a horrible experience that in practice isn't really doable. On, there's a lot of hardware where you just can't enroll keys. So where this goes is, how do we find a way to do this that safeguards safety of the project keys, but doesn't impose a new burden on the SIGs and on the project? And the options that were outlined when we had the discussion with Infra were basically, there's like a sliding scale of closeness we can take. We can decide that we don't consider this an issue. We will just use the project key and allow SIGs to sign stuff using the project key from CVS. These basically puts artifacts that come out to the SIG at the same level as artifacts that come out to the project itself, but it does mean that then CVS needs to have access to the private keys used for signing, which are in, a, in the HSM, and these have some security implications. Another option could be that we make a separate key that we call, this, say, the CentOS SIG keys. We use that for signing all of the SIG artifacts, and then we work with Microsoft to get that key added to Shim as like a, as a key trusted there in the same way. So it would be a different key in a different HSM that's used only for content built from by CVS. Um, there's a few other options here, but I think those are like the, the main the main ones. Well, the other option is do nothing, and then six can't do this. Uh, that kind of sucks, in my opinion. So I, I'd like to find a solution here. So I have a strong preference for number two. Uh, not that I don't love and trust all of our SIG friends, but if you are in a sort of regulatory space, you need to be able to say, I know the names and the people who are doing all of the things that are building all of this. And so from a regulatory space, there needs to be a way to clearly dis uh, disambiguate the project from our volunteer SIG efforts. So if we go down this path, to be clear, what this practically entails, to my understanding, is that we need to some, well, someone needs to buy and provision an, a dedicated HSM infra for this, get the keys, hook them up to CVS, which will involve some work from CPE, I assume. And then we need to work with Microsoft to do the whole getting this into Shim. So from, uh, from my perspective, I think, you know, speaking for, um, uh, speaking for the infra work, like we can, we can definitely take care of that if, if that's the direction that we go. I think in, in this venue, it would be good to figure out a, um, a long-term governance structure for the folks that are interacting with Microsoft because Microsoft is going to want, uh, you know, a, a certain set of names of people who can, uh, you know, apply for uh, managing some of those, the, the keys and resigning. And uh, if it, well, it turns out that we truly do need the different shim infrastructure, then we need some uh, sort of some trusted uh, sets of folks that actually manage that. Um, so if that, we do a level of trust, if we do one key for all the SIGs, which I think is probably the simplest approach, we can just have a project manage key and have someone within the project that manages it. Doesn't have to be someone from any specific SIG uh, that deals with Microsoft. And then I assume the SIGs would interact, would just interact through CDS in the same way that regular builds are done. Or if that if that is already, they could interact via a human that has access to the key and can do manual signing as a right. stopgap. And, and I think we can, like, we can cover that part from, uh, you, you know, as parts of CPE or the InfraSig. I think the, uh, the question I would ask the directors is, uh, can we figure out who that person would be and what sort of structure do we want to set up in, in place for the, the folks that do have access to those keys? Um, and how do we assure that that's, you know, we have a long-term plan for, for maintaining that, that sort of thing? So first thing first, does this need to be someone that works at Red Hat? Because I assume whoever does that will need to have access to the actual key, which means having access to the HSM and all that jazz. 
Yeah, so doing this as a um, as a, a separate community infrastructure, um, and this uh, this will be a question that I'll um, I'll triple confirm with Bex, but I I don't think that person necessarily needs to work a Red Hat. Since Bex is on this call, um, I'm going to artfully dodge the question momentarily, um, and. I know I always speak with the great gravelly voice of Red Hat, but I need to ask a question that is genuinely a question and not leading at all towards any opinion. So please read it very carefully. Pat, can you help me understand what kind of guarantees you're trying to make about the project versus the SIGs? Because from my perspective, it's kind of feels like one most of the time. The project is the project. And we happen to have a unique structure around some code where some code is controlled in terms of who's allowed to make commits because it winds up becoming rel. And the SIG code, for example, does not take the same path. And so the SIGs make their own decision about who control commits. But, um, and, and this has been an ongoing argument in a lot of venues. I'm just genuinely trying to understand the board's perspective on why having all of the code or all of the builds signed by the same key is a problem with the caveat that I understand that if the crazy people SIG somehow managed to get approved and sign crazy people SIG kernel things and then Microsoft went, yo, that's crazy, nothing would boot. Um, but I'm also assuming that the board would not require me to be the sole veto person of the crazy people SIG and that it would simply not happen. So. That was a long-winded way of dodging Brian's question temporarily. Yeah, uh, the primary thing I'm looking for slash at is a lot of our uh, controls documents are written more for proprietary slash sole controlled vendorship software. Uh, on this, you know, for example, the quantum computing network, we can only run code that was assured by this way or this way or this way. And I can make those agreements that, okay, because the stream nine stuff goes through the Red Hat engineers, I can say, yes, it has a list of controlled people who are all fully named and fully iterated and someone ran a background check on them. Whereas with the stream stuff, I can do that, but I can't necessarily prove it to my larger governing entities. And so that just makes them a little nervous. But so to be to be clear, is your concern that if we were to use the same key for both, is your concern that this key can be used to sign artifacts by people that haven't gone through this process? Yes. Okay. Uh, and like I trust all of you. I'm not concerned about it. I'm some bureaucrat somewhere might look at that and go, okay, but that person's not an employee who signed a thing. That's against the rules, shut it down. Yeah, no, that I, th I think that's fair. So in that case, would that mean that dedicate is key for all the SIGs solve this issue for you? So if we had one key for the project, which is the one we have now, and then one key that all the SIGs share? Yeah, that would be solved for me. Because then I could say oh. definitively, I know for a fact that this was signed by community members who have undergone this kind of vetting, or I know for a fact this was signed by you know W2 employees at this company that have undergone their vetting and it becomes their risk problem. Okay, yeah, so if this is purely a regulatory concern, yeah, I think that's fine. One thing to keep in mind though is that from a practical perspective, there is absolutely no difference because yes. if both keys are in shim, both keys have the same power effectively, so. Yeah, this is largely a paperwork issue. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm fine with it, like the, the proposal that I, said many, many moons ago that I don't actually completely remember the details anymore, but it basically boiled down to the project key would have a delegate key under it that we would then use for, for that, uh, for the, um, what's it called, for the SIG stuff. And so it would be a separate key that we can independently revoke without having to revoke the whole project key. And that also saves space for shim and makes it so that we don't have to do terrible things to make it so that we can figure out how people can deal with how to boot things because as it turns out telling having people figure out how to boot things has gotten harder and harder and harder and i just 
and it's just not practical anymore to to have people do that kind of crap. So if we did the delegate key, would the delegate key also need to be worked out with Microsoft for Shim, or would that fall under the main project key? Well, so the main project key would have been the main key that comes from Microsoft goes to Shim, and then the main project key goes to Microsoft also to cross trust. And then the delegate key would inherit its trust from the project key. Uh, so in theory, it shouldn't require another Microsoft round trip. Would this satisfy your concern, Pat? Yeah, as long as I can prove cryptographically that there's a difference between them. The, where I can say this one was clearly signed by this yeah. key and this one was clearly signed by this key. I mean, honestly, like, if somehow we could assign the kernel modules three or four times, as long as there's a difference between the keys and I can say which key did which things, that's all I need to do to fill out my paperwork. So, I um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Bex. I, as I say, one thing that I would like to have known coming out, out of this conversation is that I actually need to take some of this back to have a conversation with someone inside of Red Hat before I can cast my final vote. Uh, on this kind of a concept, because there's a comment here being made around a regulatory guarantee, and I need to validate that Red Hat's actually making that kind of a guarantee here, because there seems to be a lot of comment being addressed by the fact that because Red Hat employees happen to be doing something today, we are going to make a statement that that is the way things are, and I want to make sure that that's going to hold true in a way that's not going to run into trouble down the road. So. I'm not saying yay or nay today as much as I'm saying that when we get out of this, if the final proposal is two keys, Pat, I want to make sure I fully understand what it is you're trying to accomplish so I can make sure that that's going to be a true statement if we come out in support of that. Yeah, and I'm happy to sit with you and basically go over the paperwork to show you that exactly what I'm looking at. It's long and frustrating for this call, but it's Hey, and that's fine. And I'm not I'm not asking you to detail the rabbit hole on the call. Just I'm wanting to, you to be aware that like my ears perk up at the words regulatory. And those are one of those things that I have to go back and make sure my hands won't get slapped over um, yeah. and that we don't accidentally wind up saying that is something that is not true because big R turns into bad problems down the road. I would appreciate if one of the Red Hat folks would also do a, a brief compare and contrast with Fedora, because this feels like we're trying to be a little belt and suspenders with old CentOS moving to new CentOS, and it may not be quite that strict. Yeah, in the past, I want to say, this hasn't, in, in, in Fedora land, we've had non-Red Hatter kernel maintainers who have had access to the secure boot channel to be able to build things and whatever. Like today, that's not true. We have no non-Red Hatter maintainers and um, the kernel maintainer team uh, of one is not particularly uh, um, interested in more um, maintainers right now. So there's, there's that. But um, in the past, it hasn't, it, it, it hasn't really come up as a, as a fundamental issue. Um, but also, the setup Fedora has is considerably less overkill than the one that CentOS has even right now. So that that also changes a lot of the you know the dynamics here. Like it's been a royal pain in the butt to even have auto signing for packages in CentOS because someone has decided that we need to be overkill here compared to what was done in Fedora. And so that, well, that, so there's a dimension of political problems that probably need to be resolved there. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to get, um, I'm, I'm happy to take some more of these, uh, these technical questions and, and sort of generate a, a contrast here if, if that's what we're interested in. Um, I, I think the problem we're going to find, um, because if we decide to change the way or, or change the infrastructure that we use for signing. Uh, that's going to uh, uh, change the infrastructure that we use for uh, signing core artifacts, then that's going to necessitate that we completely rekey, um, mostly because we can't exfiltrate any of that out of the existing HSM and we can't, uh, we can't add 
uh, other paths into uh, communication with that set of infrastructure. So it's um, it's pretty difficult to be honest, but um, but yeah, I'm happy to take a, a, a little piece of homework to do some um, uh, some comparisons there. Yeah, and I think it might be valuable to get from from CPE's standpoint, uh, like if, if not a proposal, but like an idea of how this could work with the infrastructure in place, and like the what we just discussed, having either having a delegate key or having a dedicated key that the six share, and whether there's any concerns that we that need to be addressed in this forum. Uh, like what I don't want to happen to be clear is that we we agree on something and then six months pass and we come back we like oh no there was a showstopper that makes this impossible mm -hmm. and if that's the case i would like to find it out now and not in six months so we can come up with a different solution Yeah, and the so that delegate key um, structure is also something I'm going to have to validate with uh, you know, some of our folks who work on the um, the uh, the signing servers and stuff. I want to be sure that we can actually do that from a technical perspective. Brian, now coming back to your question that you said I would want to talk to Bex about that. Let's fold that question and Pat's regulatory piece into this as well so that the document reflects both the realities of what we do as well as the technical limitations or opportunities we may have instead of keeping those separate. I um, mean, I'm happy to be part of that conversation and um, Candidly, you'll probably get much straighter answers from Pat directly, but I'm also happy to help proxy in Pat's comments should there be an internal doc for some reason. And for what it's worth, since we, for what it appears to be, we don't actually have secure boot stuff set up yet in, in nine, it, it'd be nice to greenfield with a solution in nine that, that works for both uh, the core and the SIGs, because then we don't have to do a rekey and we don't have to deal with the mess that happened with the last time the keys had to be rotated. So it's sort of fortuitous we're doing this now rather than later. And I'm sort of okay with the nine only solution for this because from the hyperscale perspective, our focus is gonna be transitioning mostly to nine for the artifacts that we care about secure boot for. Yeah, I was going to say, if, if it turns out that doing this as a nine forward solution is much easier than backporting this to eight, that might be a reasonable option here. All right, I feel like we've come to the end of that topic um, and that everything else is going on in a, a separate conversation. So I will move along unless anyone objects. All right, um, we have a number of, of open issues and uh, I reviewed all of them before this meeting and I, I think that they are all, well, anyway, I'll go through them. The first one is 67, which, which refers to what we just got done discussing. Um, the second one is regarding a, uh, uh, a, web, a web page on the Intel website that indicates that they will no longer be supporting a particular API for CentOS um, at, after the end of this year. And I've reached out to them to ask about um, their position on, on CentOS Stream. Um, of course, I have not heard back yet on that. And I, I don't know who the right contact is. If anyone has any actual personal contact, I would appreciate that. Um, the, the next issue is number 45, which we have been kicking down the road for three board meetings now. This is a proposal policy that was drafted and approved and needs to be published somewhere. I feel like in the last two meetings, we agreed on a place to publish it and then it still didn't happen. So, I, and, I, and we, didn't, we didn't minute it. So does anyone recall 
where we wanted this published. And to, to remind you, this is the, uh, the policy on naming artifacts that come out of variants in a standard way. I thought we were going to put that in the SIG handbook. I thought that was the plan as well. At least okay. I vaguely remember a chat that. Yeah, we just didn't take notes on that. So <laughs> that works. The, um, All right, well, I will take the I, action I item to do it. this unless somebody else steps up. Oh, right. can you hear me? Yes. Yes. We can. I. Uh, I, I think the SIG handbook is the right place for this. Uh, I did make the comment when we talked about it before that it would might be worth adding a, a note, a reference to that policy in the um, the trademark guidelines, because um, somebody looking for the answer here might want might go there first. Yeah, I remember you now. You should move said that. the trademark guidelines to the docs as well, because that could also be folded into how to make remixes in general, which is a process that I am discovering is a wonderful adventure that somewhat that should all be written down somewhere. Um, and so it'd be a, probably a good idea to like have a section about how to do derivatives and remixes of CentOS. And then we could have instructional aspects, um, got requirements for, for policy requirements, trademark requirements, and all those things like in one place because like the sad situation in Fedora is something I don't really want to repeat here, which is we have these pieces kind of scattered all over the place. Nobody knows how to do anything and it doesn't happen for anyone. And so it just is a whole bunch of work that's wasted because nobody ever takes advantage of it. Would you be willing to open a ticket enumerating those things that, that you'd like sure. to see documented and I can take a stab at drafting that? Yeah, sure. Where do you want me to do, to file the ticket? Because I don't actually know where. Uh, put it in the in the board tracker, and sure. I guess we can. I mean, it's sort of a catch all at this point. Sure, why not? Uh, didn't we make a documentation sig? I don't know. We never did make a documentation sig. There was a. There's actually an email thread on Centus Devel about that right now, so maybe we'll have one next month. We'll see. Okay, maybe. I must have missed that documentation chat. I'll have to find that. I almost missed it too until like a couple of days ago when I was trawling through the devil and, and saw it and I replied to it. Um, the last ticket that's listed here is, is something that I, I'm not sure how to proceed on. And this is about um, a retirement plan for departing directors, what we have to do to clean up when a director leaves. And I, I'm just not sure how to attack this. I'm not sure what permissions former directors currently have. I'm not sure what permissions current directors have that we would need to clean up about. And uh, I'm not sure where to look. So I could use some direction here. Probably the mailing list and the IRC channel are the main things. And I guess the hack and the space. Yeah, okay. But basically any, anything that has private documentation, I would say is probably something worth of cleaning up. Yeah, no I think it includes Google Drive. Oh, oh it's, we're no longer using the Google Drive, so that is... Uh, yeah. That got retired. Yeah. Uh, maybe some, mem like uh, the ownership of the mailing list as well, because I remember Carambi was maybe owner of one of the mailing lists, so this is what would need to be checked. Okay. So I That's think a good place um, to start. From, for from IRC. my perspective, go ahead, go ahead Jim. So I think uh, one thing that would be really helpful from an InfraSig perspective um, is like, because I know there's some uh, there's some lingering infrastructure access based on like years and years and years ago uh, of things that folks uh, that uh, directors had access to. Um, a statement from from the board with a vote saying, you know, yes, we are okay with having old directors removed from uh, previous infrastructure access. That would be very helpful for us as the InfraSig to go and just do what we need to do for uh, for things like the mailing list and then other places where we find uh, stale access controls like that. 
on the IRC side with the move to Libera, I'm basically one of the owners for all of the CentOS channels. Um, so that access should probably go away. Depends on how much you trust me after I'm uh, ostensibly no longer available. Um, and and we that's trust you very much. We like you. That's kind of a what one of my first responses when this ticket was first logged was, you know, just because somebody's no longer on the board doesn't mean they lose trust across the whole project. But uh, there are a narrow set of things that should just be accessed by the board, and we want to keep that as narrow as possible because we want to be as transparent as possible. So. Uh, is Rich also, like for the IRC channels, is Rich also a co-owner of, of the namespace? I think that I am, yes. Yes. So if you are, then I don't care. Then then okay. it's fine having Jim be part of the owners of it, because as long as Rich is also one, and Rich is employed by Red Hat to maintain the community presences, stuff, things, then I'm not worried about it. As long as there's someone that can ultimately like intercede and be the quote unquote authority in case somebody goes rogue. I don't have a problem with other people doing it. And also, also John Dennison is, is on that list as well. Right. So I'd like to draw a parallel between this and the previous conversation we were having about signing keys. Um, like it, it seems to me that in some ways we're having the opposite of that conversation now. And uh, at least from my perspective, I feel like it would be helpful to understand what, if anything, a board member should have access to solely through their position in the board. Yeah. And then everything else is by definition managed elsewhere through IRC yeah. management process or whatever. Like I happen to have access to a bunch of repositories related to documentation and website by virtue of work that I did long before I was asked to sit on the board as a Red Hat liaison. Whether I should still have that permission is a different question, but it has nothing to do with the role that I have. That's right. Um, and I feel and like I that list should be, as I said, as minimal as possible. All right, well, this gives me a good place to start. Um, the remaining tickets that we've been kicking down the road for a year or more, I've moved to the on hold section um, very briefly, the first one of these is regarding the logo. And, and the last time I spoke with LA and he was still tinkering with, with logo stuff. And so that's kind of in his, in his uh, bailiwick at the moment. And I'm not going to seek registration until I hear from him that he's completed. The other two are regarding cloud images. And uh, I, I don't even know that these are board issues, but uh, my understanding is that these are still discussions in process. Unless somebody tells me differently, I'm just going to move on past these. Um, we have a couple informational items for those of you that did not see, and I hope you all did see. We did a sort of a, a splash uh, promotional launch around CentOS Stream 9. Um, we did this in conjunction with uh, the Red Hat marketing folks who signed off on some of the messaging. Um, so that was kind of cool that they participated in that process. Um, but what was really cool from my perspective was that the blog post was entirely written by non-Red Hatters. And uh, that was a big win because it could say some things that I probably couldn't get past marketing. Um, the other item on my list is that uh, we have opened a CFP for the FOSDEM CentOS Dojo. And uh, it would be nice to have yet another board AMA there. So just keep that in mind as you look forward in your schedule to the first Friday in February, whatever that date is. That is the fourth, Friday, February 4th. So that would be, if you could tentatively put that on your schedule, those that have participated in the past, um, that would be helpful. We have two SIGs reporting this month, and those are in the newsletter that was just published on Tuesday to the blog. So uh, hopefully you all have seen those. And if you haven't, I encourage you to read that newsletter and skim to the bottom and, and find those SIG reports. 
And that brings us to the end of the public agenda. Uh, are there any other topics that people wish to discuss before we move to executive session? Going, going. All right, well, thank you all. Um, thank you to our guests for attending. And I ask that you would drop off the call at this time. We're going to go to a very brief executive session and uh, halt the recording for that.